When were you first considered a family? When you fell in love? When you got married? When you had kids? When did you first fight to be considered a family? When you fell in love? When you got married? When you had kids? Family isn't defined by who you love, but how. Tylenol. I've never been more optimistic about the future than I am today. I mean that. The reason is because of this new generation of young people. They're the best educated. They're the least prejudiced. They're the most open generation in American history. And although I have no scientific basis for about to say, but those of you who are over 50, how often did you ever see, how often did you ever see advertisements on television with black and white couples? As you can see, we have a big brood. With a lot of mouths to feed. Fortunately, PetSmart has a wide assortment of foods for us to choose from. All our animals eat different and have different eating styles. Emmett's a big eater. Who is? It's Emmett. Emmett's a huge eater. Yeah. This is our picky eater. Yes, you're the picky eater. Who's the picky eater? I even thought for a while maybe I could, I don't know, I could nurse her just to help along. To... Not a joke. I challenge you. Find today, when you turn on the stations, sit on one station for two hours, and I don't know how many commercials you'll see, lay eight to five. Two to three out of five have mixed-race couples in them. That's not by accident. They're selling soap, man. <laughs> Next guest is a truly fascinating gentleman. He happens to be 93 years old, and he is the father of public relations. In the course of his 70-year career, some of his clients have been Presidents Wilson, Hoover, Coolidge, and Eisenhower, Thomas Edison, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Enrico Caruso. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Edward Bernays. Let's talk a little bit about uh, public relations. You've been doing it for 70 years. Who were some 72. of your... 72. 72. Who were some of your early accounts? Who, did, who were clients of yours back in the very well, beginning? Well, in the very beginning, Procter & Gamble was one of our accounts. Mm -hmm. They had a white floating soap called the ivory soap. Right. It, that's, that was the selling point. It would actually float in the bathtub or wherever you were bathing, I guess. That's right. <laughs> and they came to me one day and said that mothers 
uh, washed the faces of the children, and they hated soap because their eyes were stinging from the soap. And that when people grew up, they wouldn't use any soap right. because they get conditioned in childhood, according to Freud, my uncle. Uh, See, so you're, you're getting ahead of yourself, but it's true, your, your uncle was Sigmund Freud. And so we made a research, made a study, and we found a sculptor, Brenda Putnam, who used soap instead of wax in developing her sculpture. Mm -hmm. And it then occurred to me that if we could develop soap sculpture competitions, I went to a psychologist and he said every child has a creative instinct. If we, <clears throat> if we got some sculptors to be judges and had soap sculpture competitions for children in different age groups. That would get them accustomed to using the soap. That would get them did it, did to love work? soap. Did not it work? Only accustomed to it. The fascinating thing to me was that after the first year, 22 million children were loving soap and the <laughs> sale of soap just went up. Well, if you say so. Uh, not a joke. Remember old Pat Cadell used to say, you want to know what's happened in American culture? Watch advertising. Because they want to sell what they have. They have hope. And folks like you, I really mean it. Are you talking about